Hello, folks. So we are back. We're back with our our last worked example. Uh, this is number 41 from chapter 11. It reads, a 200 gram ball is dropped from a height of two meters, bounces on a hard floor, and rebounds to a height of 1.5 meters. The figure shows the impulse received from the floor. What maximum force does the floor exert on the ball? So we have this nice time dependent force here. Um, and so we already know right off the bat, this system is non isolated. What are some key um, kind of uh, uh, red flags to, to show us that it's not isolated? Well, first off, it mentions impulse. It mentions impulse in the problem, and it, whenever we think about impulse, we should be thinking a bit about non-isolated collisions, um, specifically non-isolated systems that collide. The other big giveaway here is that we are interacting with the floor. I've said this a couple times now, Whenever we interact with the floor, whenever we interact with a wall, whenever we interact with a ceiling, whenever we interact with the ground, these are all um, situations that should um, set off a, a red light that we are maybe thinking about non-isolated systems. So, so if we are non-isolated, what does that mean? What does that mean for a system non-isolated? Non-isolated means that delta P is going to be equal to not to zero, but to the impulse, the total impulse from external forces. Um, all right, so if we're thinking about this, we have, uh, what, what do we have? The change in, in momentum. Well, the change in momentum final and initial Final, final, right, is just this ball. The, the system is the ball. The wall, or I should say the, the, the ground, is providing this, right? Ground provides. So our system is just of the bouncy ball, right? So if we think about the bouncy ball, I have M times VF minus M times VI. And I need to think about the directional aspects of this. Um, the m's are constant, so that's nice. And then I have uh, this integral from t1 to t2 of f of t dt. Right. Um, all right. So so let's think about this. Um, I also have a hidden energy problem. We're going to see this a lot. We're going to use energy to find out something about um, velocities. We're going to use kinetic energy to find out something about velocities. We're going to use potential energy um, to, to do this as well. So what I have here is mgh equals 1 half k, nope, not k, 1 half mv squared for our kinetic energy. Masses are going to be canceling. And so my velocity is going to be 2gh, take a square root. If I think about how high we started off, I have a square root of 2, 9.8 times 2 meters. And if I uh, plug that into my handy dandy calculator here, 2 times 9.8 times 2, I get, let me square root the whole thing, um, 6.26 meters per second. So that's my, that's my initial velocity, right? That's my initial velocity. And I think um, the way that I want to do this is to say that VI is going to be negative, right? So I have M times this VF, which I'm going to leave blank for now, uh, minus negative 6.26 meters per second. Now, why are we saying that VI is negative? Well, it points down. Right, it points down, and normally we say that pointing down is negative, and pointing up would be positive. So my final velocity after the collision with the ground 
is going to be positive. It points up. That makes sense if I'm thinking about the force from the ground. It should be positive, and that's what we see in our, our figure as well, our plot. So the last thing that we can, uh, need to do is figure out VF. We can do the exact same trick. V is going to be 2GH. Uh, we know the height um, that we ended up with, 2 times 9.8. Um, and I believe it was, yes, 1.5. Take a square root. Let's plug it into our calculator. 3 times 9.8. Take a square root. I get 5.42 meters per second. Well, that makes sense. This is good. You know, normally when we have um, a a collision like this, we usually don't get back up to the same position, right? We expect a lower velocity. We lose some energy here. So let's plug this in: uh, 5.42 meters per second. And this is equal to this integral. Now, we have a very definite shape here. What I can say, how, you know, how can I calculate this? I'm sorry for the, the really grainy image here. But I can calculate it by looking at this area underneath my curve. right? And I know that it's 5 milliseconds. So we're talking really short amounts of time here. right? So what is the area of a triangle? Well, it's base times height times 1 half. So I have 1 half times 5 times 10 to the negative third seconds times this f max, my height. All right, well, I think, um, I think we're pretty much good, except I just need to plug in my mass over here, right? Let's do that in the next step. Let's, let's say I have 0 0.2 kilograms, right? We need to work in SI units um, times 5.42 plus 6.26, that's meters per second, uh, divided by my one half times five times ten to the negative third seconds if i think about this i'm going to get kilograms meters per second squared and that's a newton so that equals my f max uh, let's plug and chug let's plug and chug 0.2 times the sum of 5.42 plus 6.26 all divided by uh, quantity 0.5 times 5e negative 3. I get 934 newtons. That seems appropriate. It seems like a lot. It seems like a lot. But these collisions are happening over very, very small amounts of time. And so the peak of that force can be quite large. It can be quite large. Um, but it's exerted over such a small amount of time um, that we can get a more reasonable impulse. So this is a non-isolated problem. I really like this problem. Uh, I think it's a nice integration of, uh, of, of plots, using integration of plots. Um, that was wordplay I didn't in, intend for. Um, but it also uh, works with a non-isolated problem, a non-isolated system which a lot of things that we do in this class, we're going to talk about isolated systems. So I think this is a nice uh, stretching of our talents and our, our uh, abilities here to talk about a non-isolated problem. So that's number 41. If you have any questions, come see me in an office hour or shoot me an email. Have a good one.